our last evening, last event of this 2020 STEM Pathways for Girls conference. Woo, we are really tired, and but at the same time excited that we had spent two full days running workshops, 12 amazing workshops took place. We loved seeing the faces of all the girls that participated and seeing their creations. And we're gonna post some pictures on social media. We did already, we had already posted some. Today, we finished up with six more workshops. Girls learned about gears. They uh, learned about outbreak investigations and actually had a little conversation about COVID. They learned how to build a constellation and, uh, and the black holes, blasted some rockets into space and played with acids and bases and tested the pH and mixed them up and had them some hypotheses and they build roller coasters at home and we had some cool photos and hopefully we'll be receiving videos from some of you on that. And at that note, so we've got six workshops today and we got six raffle drawings to do. So let's get started. Trisha is going to roll the wheel and our first workshop, what is it? What was our first workshop? It was the uh, all about gears, right? Yes, it was. Let me go ahead and um, share my screen. And appropriately, the prize is also all about gears. All right, so let's take a second here. Um, so we had two sessions of every workshop. So this one is our first session, the All About Gears. Um, if you were in the first session, you are in this group of names. If you were in the second session, you're in this group of names. All right. Who's our winner? <laughs> oh, it's a close one. It is Tristy S. Congratulations. We won this 3D uh, mechanical box that can turn into a jewelry box or a secret box. All yours. Good. And we will, of course, find a way to uh, socially distance and <laughs> hand it to you. Okay, our next workshop here. Um, this is the outbreak investigation. So if you were in the first session for the day, um, you are in this group of names. If you were in the second session, you are in this group of names. And our winner is Zoe. And Zoe, you win a mini drone. I don't know. It looks better inside the box, probably. <laughs> Our third one for the evening um, was exploring stars and black holes. And we had quite a list for this one. So first session of the day, you are in this category. So you're in this group of names. Second session, you are here. Okay, our winner is And Madeline, you won a globe that has the constellation on it and the globe during the day and a projector. Very fitting for exploring <laughs> stars. <laughs> and then we have next, blasting into space. 
Um, so if you were in the first session, you are here. And if you were in the second session, you were right here. Savannah. And Savannah, you win a snap circuit set with a lot of fun circuits to build. Next drawing up, we have for our exploring pH or chemistry uh, workshop for today. So if you were in the first session, Alphabetically, you are in this group. And if you were in the second session, you are in this group. And let's see who wins. Destiny, and Destiny wins appropriately a chemistry set. You can take all the knowledge you learned today and, and more at home. At home. <laughs> and then our final raffle of the evening um, is for our Marvel roller coaster workshop. So first session. Your name is here. So again, it's alphabetical. Quite a list of names, so I'll try to go a little slow so everybody can catch to see if their name is here. And then if you were in the second group, you are in this category. And our winner is final drawing of the evening. Was it Kara G? Yes. Okay. And Kara, you won a Gravity Maze logic game. More on roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. Congratulations. And we'll be in touch with all 12 winners of the raffle prizes and we'll find a way to get it to you in a safe way, wearing our masks for sure. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to our Master of Ceremonies, Shannon Beck. Yay, that was great. Just like a quick little energy shot here. Wanna cheer, congrats to all the winners. Um, I, we're gonna have an amazing speaker coming up. We've got Madame Curie, she's coming to you. Um, she's based in Minneapolis with the Math Theater but they're actually coming, she's coming to you from Taiwan where it's 9.30 in the morning there. And as Madame Curie speaks, we want to make sure that any questions that you have, um, you can text the registration number or email that registration account that was sent to you. And so the math theater uses live theater to tell stories that inspire excitement about math and science. As you all saw today and yesterday, there's lots to be excited about with math and science and all of STEM. Since 2006, they've been traveling the world with live stage shows that dramatize not only math and science concepts, but the human stories behind those scientific discoveries. So live theater is a really powerful experience that allows our imagination to connect with history. And we are very honored to have math theater and Madame Curie with us this evening. Hello. Hello, Jean Dobre. My name is Marie Skwadowska Curie, and I am a scientist. I understand there are quite a few people here who are also scientists. Perhaps you are familiar with some of my discoveries. 
my work as a physical chemist was very important to the understanding of radioactivity. And in fact, radioactivity is a word I came up with. My husband, Pierre Curie, and I discovered two radioactive elements, and I was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. I am very honored to be invited to speak to you on this special occasion. Dzień dobry is how we say hello in Polish. So if you like, you can say it with me. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. I grew up in Poland in the 1800s, and at that time, Poland was occupied by Russia. It was illegal for Polish people like me to speak our own language. So the words we just said, those words were against the law. It was also illegal for girls to go to college. I went to the girls' high school, and once I finished, I had to educate myself in secret. I loved science and math, but after I finished high school, I had to gather with other young women my age to talk about math and science in a secret organization we called the Flying University. It was very dangerous because if the Russian authorities caught us learning about science, we would be in big trouble. We could go to prison or even worse. What do you think you would do if it were illegal for you to learn? To me, it was worth all the risks because to me, nothing is more important than learning. During the day, I worked as a governess and a tutor. I worked for a farming family in the Polish countryside, and I thought it was very important for the children who lived and worked on farms to have an opportunity to have an education. I would gather children together and teach them to read and teach them mathematics. I also taught them about Polish history and Polish language, even though Russia had made it illegal. Some people thought these children didn't need to know how to read or how to do math because they lived on a farm. I very much believe that to build a better world, we must first improve the individual. If each of us can learn as much as we can and become the best version of ourselves that we can be, then together we can make the world a better place for everyone. What do you think? Well, for me, education was very difficult to access, but it was the most important thing in the world to me. I studied at night and I worked very hard during the day and I saved enough money to go to college in France. Remember how I said my first language is Polish, but it was illegal to speak it in Poland. I had to learn to speak Russian in public places in Poland. And now I lived in France, I had to learn to speak French does anyone here speak more than one language? I love my home country of Poland, but France was a completely different place. In France, girls and women are allowed to be educated. So I enrolled at a university called the Sorbonne in Paris, but it was still very difficult because even though girls and women were allowed to study, a lot of people still thought we weren't smart enough to be scientists. There were not a lot of women who actually went to college and studied science and math. I was usually the only woman in my class, and a lot of my teachers and fellow students expected me to fail. But I loved science and math so much that I worked very, very hard, and I proved them wrong. One time, there was a big important math test and our names and our scores were posted on the wall. This was a very difficult exam and it was very competitive to see who did the best. All my classmates were confused because they did not recognize the name at the very top of the list with the very highest score. They didn't recognize the name because it was the last one they expected to see, mine. I earned my first college degree in physics and a year later, I earned a second degree in mathematics. Then I had a job doing experiments on different types of steel, which was very interesting and exciting job, but I couldn't find any laboratory space to actually do my experiments. 
Nobody wanted to share their lab space with a woman scientist because they didn't think I was doing real work. Have you ever had an experience where someone wouldn't share with you? The only person in Paris who would share his laboratory with a woman scientist and speak to me as an equal was a man named Pierre Curie. After growing up in a country where learning about science was illegal for me and then going to university with people who expected me to fail, it was a big surprise to meet a man who treated me like a scientist and accepted that I was as smart as him or maybe even smarter. Science was something we both felt very strongly about and it made us fall in love. We got married and we worked in our lab together. Still a lot of people thought he was the scientist and I was his assistant. Have you ever worked on something together with someone else but they got all the credit and you got none? It feels terrible. But do you know what Pierre did? He would always correct them and make sure everyone knew that we were equal partners. We worked together as the perfect team. And eventually we got very interested in a very special mineral. You probably already know a mineral is a solid chemical compound, which means a solid substance made of more than one element. So a very simple example, maybe you can see different colors in this rock, like pink and white and gray. Now this is one simple indication that there are many different elements present in this mineral. An element is a substance with only one kind of atom. Oxygen is an element, calcium is an element, gold is an element. I'm sure you know many, many other elements. An element is different from a mineral because an element cannot be reduced into any more ingredients. An element is a pure substance and its, this, and its smallest unit is called an atom. When you study chemistry today, you learn about how an atom can be further broken down into a nucleus made of particles called protons and neutrons surrounded by particles called electrons. But I'm getting ahead of my story because at the time my husband Pierre and I got interested in our special mineral, nobody knew yet that an atom could be broken down into smaller particles. We thought one atom was the smallest any element could ever be reduced and that was that. So I'm going to tell you my story of what happened and how our understanding of atoms changed when we started doing experiments. Pierre and I did experiments on a mineral called pitchblende, which is a type of ore. An ore is any solid natural material that contains elements that can be removed for useful purposes. We got interested in pitch blend as a mineral ore because one of the elements it contains is uranium. We wanted to do experiments on uranium because scientists had started to realize uranium does something very strange and it acted very differently from most other elements we knew. A colleague of ours noticed that uranium was producing a kind of energy all by itself. We could measure energy radiating from uranium, even when it wasn't reacting to anything. We didn't yet understand exactly what this energy was or what caused it or what its effects were, but I gave it the name radioactivity. To study this strange radioactivity, we studied uranium and to get uranium, we had to remove it from the mineral ore pitch blend. I have some pretend pitch blend here. I've ground it down from a rock into a powder to make it easier to separate the uranium. We removed all the uranium from our sample of pitch blend, but then just because I was curious, I measured our leftover pitch blend after the uranium had been removed and it was still radioactive. What do you think that could mean? This was a mystery that we decided to solve using the scientific method. The scientific method is a process that every good scientist uses to investigate something we're curious about. Our first step is to ask a question. Our second step is to do background research and learn everything that is already known about our curiosity. The third step is to develop a hypothesis. 
The fourth step is to test our hypothesis with experiments. And finally, we might draw a conclusion and communicate our results. So we started with a question. Why is our sample of pitch blend still radioactive, even after the radioactive uranium has been removed? So then we did step two of the scientific method, background research. We tested all the other known elements to see if there was another element that might be radioactive besides uranium. Through these tests, we learned that besides uranium, thorium is also a radioactive element. So we made sure to remove all the uranium and all the thorium from our samples, but the pitch blend was still radioactive. So it was time for the next step in the scientific method. We developed a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess. Now, based on our observations, we thought it was possible that pitch blend contains some radioactive element that has not been discovered yet. So using the scientific method, our next step was to test our hypothesis by conducting experiments. Now, I understand there are some of you here today who enjoy doing experiments, yes? For our experiment, we took the pitch blend apart step by step, isolating every individual element to see if we could find one we didn't recognize. How would you separate individual elements from a mineral? We did it by creating chemical reactions. We pour different types of acid onto the pitch blend, which would cause chemical reactions to separate different elements so we could isolate them. Would you like to see how we did this? So if I take different types of acid and I add it to the powdered mineral, I will observe whether the element Re whether any element reacts to my acid. So today I will add this acid, which I know reacts with sodium. If there's a reaction, I know this mineral contains sodium and I can separate it. So let's try and you watch closely for any kind of reaction. Yes, I think that's definitely reacting. What do you think? Now, because I can see that this sodium in this pitch blend is reacting to this type of acid, I can separate that element and continue separating elements to find out every single element inside this mineral. We did this over and over and over and over and over again with different types of acid to isolate different elements. Only instead of a cup full of pitch blend, we had a ton, which is about 2000 pounds. How long do you think it took us to do these experiments? Four years, four years. But finally, since we first asked a question, then we did research, developed a hypothesis and tested it with experiments, we came to the last step of the scientific method, which is a conclusion. We concluded that the pitch blend was radioactive because it contained two new radioactive elements. Through our experiments, we discovered two elements that we isolated and identified for the very first time. And because we discovered them, we got to give them names. We named the first one polonium in honor of my home country, Poland. I wanted everyone to know what was going on in my home country and how difficult life was while we were under occupation from Russia. Our second element, we named radium because once we isolated it, we learned it is very, very radioactive. From the 2000 pounds of pitch blend that we reduced to their individual elements, we isolated only one tenth of one gram of radium. These discoveries made me and Pierre very famous. We won many awards and I was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize Committee actually tried to leave me out of the prize because I was a woman, but Pierre refused to accept his until I was recognized equally. And eventually, I even became the first woman professor at the Sorbonne, the college in Paris where many people thought girls weren't smart enough to be good at science. Now remember when I said that when I was your age, we didn't know atoms could be separated into protons, neutrons, and electrons. My and Pierre's work on radioactivity 
helped scientists understand that radioactive elements have an unstable nucleus and radioactive atoms actually lose some of their particles. Before our work on radioactivity, no one imagined that any substance could be smaller than an atom. This completely changed the way scientists understand the universe. Now, our work as scientists is not always easy. Each of us faces our own unique challenges and we must rise to meet them in our own way. Now, for me, I had the challenge of growing up in a place and time where girls and women were not given equal opportunities to men. I had to work exceptionally hard, first by studying science in secret, like I mentioned, then by persisting in my work with, with my work in the face of people who did not believe in me. There were always people who thought I could never be a serious scientist because I was a woman. There will always be people who judge others based on incorrect ideas and try to hold us back from reaching our true potential. And sometimes we hold ourselves back because we doubt ourselves, or we fear that we aren't good enough, or we aren't smart enough, or everything seems too hard. Now, it has been a long, hard road for scientific progress, especially for women. When we look back at history, we should take special care to recognize the women of all cultures who fought hard for equal opportunities, not only for themselves, but for other women of their own time and the women who came after. I am so glad we are gathered today to celebrate your work and your knowledge. And I hope this is only the beginning of your scientific journey. The world in your time faces a lot of problems, diseases, pollution, climate change, and on and on and on. Now, the more we understand about how the world works, the better we can work as scientists to solve these problems. There is nothing in life to be feared, only understood. And now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So I call upon you to believe in yourself and your ability to be a good scientist. Believe in your friends and your peers, no matter what their gender or their life circumstance. Support each other in becoming the best version of yourselves that you can be and use your knowledge to make the world a better place. Today, people all over the world know my name, Marie Curie, as the scientist who changed the world. And people all over the world know the name of Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a Supreme Court justice who made so many things possible for women in your time and changed the world. But I think we are in good company with you today because together, I have no doubt that you too will change the world. Thank you for listening to my story. I need to go soon, but before I do, does anyone have any questions for me? I think maybe one of our hosts might read some questions if anyone has them. Hello, thank you, Marie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What an interesting story. And if you, if you out there, if this is your first time hearing her name or hearing about her, um, I, I urge you to research her and, and read more about the books, the many, many books that have been written about her as well, because she really is notorious in the world of science, especially for what she's done for women. Um, so we are now going to accept some questions. Um, just as a reminder, you can submit your questions to our email registration at stemsantafe.org or text them to 505-539-0394. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. Do we have any questions coming in yet? While we are waiting for questions, I can recommend a very good book if you would like to read more about my life. It is a biography. It's simply called Madame Curie, and it was written by Eve Curie, who is my daughter. 
I will take a moment while we're waiting and interrupt me as soon as you get a question, but I will just take a moment to tell you how smart and wonderful both of my daughters are. My daughter, Ave is the youngest and she is a wonderful, wonderful writer. And she wrote a wonderful book about my life and about our family. And it's very, very interesting if you would like to learn more. My elder daughter, Irene, was actually became a scientist. And while I was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, my daughter, Irene, was the second. She was also a Nobel Prize winner, and I'm very, very proud of her. That's amazing. That is. Madame Curie, could you comment on um, some of the x-ray technology or some other things that you worked on to help support the troops in World War I? Oh, yes. I'm so happy that you know about this. So x-ray technology was also very new during my time. And we did not yet know, um, to, today I think it's quite normal for you to go to the doctor or to the hospital if you get hurt and you can use x-rays to look inside your own body and see your bones. Uh, but we were still learning about x-rays and learning about what it was possible to do with them. So um, during the Great War, which I believe you call World War I. This was between uh, 1914 and 1917, I think. My I, time has stopped meaning much to me. Um, it was in the 19 teens. Um, all over Europe, there was a terrible, terrible war. And very similar to, I think, what you're experiencing now, where everything is closed and you have to stay home and you cannot go to school, you cannot go to your lab. We experienced something very similar in Paris, where I was living, because of the war. So my lab was closed. I could not continue my research. I had to stop and I had to figure out something else to do. So I wanted to help the war effort because in France, there were battles going on all over the countryside of France. And by now I have lived in France for so many years that I feel great patriotism, both to my home country of Poland and also to my new adopted country of France. So to help the war effort, I took x-rays and I designed little machines that we could put onto trucks to drive out into the battlefield and give these machines to the doctors in the tents who are taking care of the wounded soldiers. And they could use, and I and my daughter, um, we taught the doctors how to use these machines to look inside the bodies of the soldiers that they were operating on. Because at that time, if there was a very simple injury, like maybe just some shrapnel or a bullet that is in maybe one of your limbs, the doctors didn't know what to do, so they would cut off your whole arm instead of just removing the little bits. And lots of infections happened and lots of lots of people were dying when they did not need to. So with our little machines, we called them petit curies, which means small curies, we drove these x-ray machines out into the battlefields. We trained the doctors how to use them and saved many, many, many lives of French soldiers on the battlefield. And I'm very proud of that. Thank you so much for asking. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. We did have a few questions come in while we were discussing uh, that first question. Yes. So I have a few. So these came uh, anonymously, so we don't have any names associated with it. But the first question is, um, weren't you afraid to work with dangerous chemicals and minerals? Oh, wasn't I afraid? So I think you're talking about radioactive elements can be very, very dangerous to work with. But we were learning about radioactivity and we did not know what the long-term effects of being exposed to radioactivity was. So my husband Pierre and I and many, many of our colleagues were always doing experiments with these elements, with uh, radium, with polonium. We did not, we just knew it was very interesting what they were doing, but we did not understand the effects that they would have on our bodies. So I would carry around, I had my little vial of radium. I would keep it in my pocket. And now you know, because of what happened to people during my time and after my time, you know that being expo directly exposed to radioactive energy like that is very dangerous. It can cause very bad things to happen to your body, but we didn't know. So I was not afraid. 
I found it very, very interesting, even though honestly, I did not feel good most of the time. I had my, both Pierre and myself had body aches. I had headaches and fevers all of the time, uh, but we continued going to work. And whether we maybe, maybe secretly in our hearts thought that maybe it was dangerous, maybe it was our work that was making us sick, we were so determined to learn and learn and learn that we just didn't we didn't fully understand and we just kind of did it anyway. So I was not afraid to answer your question, but it's very important that you not ever handle radioactive, uh, radioactive energy without appropriate protection. Yes, yes, we know, we know that now, especially I would say here in, in New Mexico. Yes. <laughs> Some of the yes. things they do to us. Well, thank you for that. We have another question that came in from Sienna. Um, she's asking, did you ever feel like giving up? Mm. <sighs> Many times I felt very frustrated because there would be obstacles. Like I would be working so hard and then there would be a big wall, right? Of someone who didn't believe me or resources that I didn't have, especially before I came to France and I had to be uh, very secretive about the work I was doing. So sometimes I would get tired Sometimes I would feel overwhelmed, but I never wanted to give up because it was very, very clear to me that the only way to make the world a better place is to make myself the best, the best myself that I could be. And to me, that was education. So I was so curious and I was so interested that to me, it gave me the energy to work through those moments that were very difficult. There you go. Perseverance, perseverance. Yeah. So keeping your eyes on the big picture, right? It's, it's very easy for us to get distracted by the here, the, the, the very frustrating things of this specific moment. But when that happens, we just need to remember that on the other side of it is the big, the big ideas that we are working towards and not lose sight of the big ideas in the little frustrations. Mm -hmm. yeah, some good advice there. Um, the next question we have is from Janelle, and she's actually curious, how did you detect radiation without any modern equipment? Ah, we had modern equipment for our time. We had a very interesting machine that my husband Pierre invented. It's called the piezoelectric quartz electrometer. And I don't know how many people still use them in your time because they are not considered modern anymore. But my husband Pierre was, had been doing interesting work on quartz crystals. And so he was using this, uh, this machine to detect uh, elect, uh, electric charge in different particles. And so I figured out that we could make some little modifications and it's very technical. So I'm not going to go into all of the details but we could make modifications to this machine to measure the radioactive energy that was coming off of, off of the elements we were testing. It was very interesting. I think you can go, I think you call it the internet, uh, which we did not have in our time, but I think you have this now and you can type piezoelectric quartz electrometer and you can see pictures of what it looked like. Very cool. Well, then that, that's some research for you, for you girls to do as well if you wanted to take a peek at some of the tools they used back then. Um, we have another question. We have a couple more that came in. So this one is from Amalia. Um, she's asking, how did it feel to have a man treat a woman as an equal? Oh, well, it was like, finally, right? Because I never doubted that I deserved to be treated like a scientist, right? I never understood why there was a distinction between man and woman in terms of intellectual ability and, um, you know, uh, competence, right? I don't understand because I am a woman and it has not affected my curiosity in the least. And I am perfectly able to do the same work that all of, you know, all of the men that I know that have the easy opportunities and easy pathways, I can work just as hard as them. And I am just as smart as them. So I don't understand why there is a difference. I don't get it. So it was very frustrating to me. And so when I met Pierre Curie, who was the first person who didn't he seemed to also not have the same um, 
prejudices that most people of our time did. So it was a big surprise and honestly a big relief. And it was just such a pleasure to work with him because that, that layer, I did not have to prove myself to him because he saw me for who I was and he understood that it he could see the troubles that I had and how difficult it was for the other people around us to to respect me. And so I really appreciated that he was always very vocal with our colleagues about giving me credit for our work. And I think that's very important when we have any kind of privilege in society that we are very uh, supportive of and recognizing other people in our, in our circle who maybe don't have all of the same privileges that we do and making sure to make space for them and making sure that they get the credit for the contributions that they are making and that everyone knows this person is the person who did this and this person is amazing. So I think that's always very important no matter what our privilege is because we all have certain privileges that are different from the people around us. So I think that's very important to be aware of that and to give credit to our colleagues when society maybe it has a hard time with that still. Uh, we have a question here from, this will be a two part one. So the first one um, came in with no name, but they're asking what scientific discovery um, that you've made is your favorite. And then we had a second question come in from Nevea, which I think can piggyback off of this. And she's asking, what's your most favorite project? So what was your favorite discovery? And what was your favorite project? If they're not the yes. same. Very good questions. My favorite discovery was the element polonium. It was very exciting because it was the first element that we discovered. We discovered two elements sort of in quick succession. We isolated polonium and then remember how I said we were taking out the elements out of the pitch blend mineral one by one. The same thing happened. We, we isolated polonium we found out it was radioactive and we thought, yes, we have figured it out. We've gotten to the end of this puzzle. And then we tested, the, just to be sure, we tested the uh, pitch blend again and it was still radioactive, which told us that there had to be another element. So we found polonium and radium in pretty quick succession, but the polonium was the first. And so it was a very special experience to me and also because like I said, I named it after my home country of Poland. So I was very hopeful because when you make a discovery like this, you get a lot of attention. There's a lot of um, interviews and people writing about you in the newspapers and, and it's very, you become rather famous. So I wanted to, I wanted to take that opportunity to uh, talk about Poland. So I named the element after Poland because I wanted the whole world to know the conditions that we were living under in Poland. Remember how I said that it was illegal to for girls to learn after high school. It was illegal to talk in to speak our native language and to talk about Polish history and lots of other terrible things. And I was very proud to have this opportunity to alert to 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 tell the world about what was going on in Poland. So I was very attached to my element of polonium. And honestly, I really like radium too a lot do not get me wrong i love radium but i it always kind of makes me irritated that radium very quickly became so much more famous than polonium <laughs> so polonium was my favorite discovery um i think my favorite project hmm, i have done a lot of projects but i was very happy later on i was able to i never got to move home to poland but i did return to poland to build an institute of radium uh, uh, an it's yes, an institute of radium in warsaw which is the city where i grew up so we had one in france and then we went and we built another one in poland so i was very very happy to be able to return to my home and to work with professors and academics and scientists in my home country and support the uh, the continuation of education and access to education about the radioactivity in my home country of Poland. And I think that was my favorite project. Very cool. And so far, um... We have a couple more. Um, this one is a fun one. So there's a seven-year-old watching right now and they are asking, how are you still alive? I thought you died a long time ago. Ah, uh, yes. 
I am coming to you through the power of your imagination, live theater and imagination. I think it's very important to keep stories like my story alive. And the way we remember uh, important people and important events is to continue telling their stories. So I am telling this story today and keeping Marie Curie alive in your imagination. There you go. And so far we have one last one. Um, this is actually coming from one of our committee me members. Um, and she's asking, did you and your husband receive any negative feedback when people started finding out about your new discoveries? Yes, there are always, I think you might say in your time, uh, something like haters going to hate. <laughs> there are always uh, people who doubt you and people, and, and some of it was legitimate, right? Because as scientists, we are always, we don't simply accept things on their face value, right? With something seems to be true, we don't accept it as true until we poke it and poke it and ask all the questions and research it and turn it inside out and make sure that it's true. And that is a very good thing. We shouldn't always accept everything as being true just because someone says so. We need to do our research and verify it and make sure that it is accepted by scientists as a community and it is accepted as a fact before we regard it as a fact. So in some ways it was good because, you know, what we were coming out with was very strange and very radical from a scientific perspective. It was so new that a lot of people, of course, were, were skeptical and were asking a lot of questions. Um, but I felt like to a certain extent, a lot of it was not exactly fair because they thought that a woman, because a woman came up with these, these new ideas, that it was, uh, that they didn't, they trusted me less than they believed my colleagues, right? Um, so that was very frustrating. And there were definitely doubters and there were people you know, I think this is still a problem in your time where people don't believe scientists. People who don't understand science think that people who are experts on things, um, they don't want to believe them because they don't, it, it upsets the way that they view the world and that is uh, not something that, that is agreeable to them. So they try to disprove it even if they don't really know what they're talking about. So it's very complicated. To an extent, definitely criticism can be a good thing, but it also can be frustrated when it is misdirected criticism. So that was very frustrating. And I got a lot of negative feedback for things in my personal life too, that people were very just extra critical of me. Um, because I was a scientist, I was also a mother. And so people were very critical about the way I raise my children and the way I keep my house because there are people who think that this is an important like judging my character is 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 a judgment of my work it's very very frustrating um and i think i, I feel like i've lost track of your question because i've been ranting did i answer your question <laughs> i think so um it was oh, yes, there, there, did you receive negative feedback <laughs> did, yes and some of much of it was scientific and much of it was personal so i guess what i'm saying is when you receive negative feedback Try your best. And it can be very hard because it hurts your feelings, right? When someone criticizes you or someone doesn't believe you, but do your best to separate the, the true criticism of your work from the criticism of your character. And just know that a lot of times people get the, those two things mixed up. So when you're evaluating criticism and deciding what to take seriously, you know, if it's something about like what you look like or what you wear or something like that, that is not valid criticism. That's just somebody who is just has funny ideas about how they think people should act and that does not affect you. If it's criticism of your work and maybe if there, if you have a chance to take a look and think, oh, well, maybe this, maybe this could be true or maybe I need to research this a little bit more or something like that, you can accept that criticism and maybe learn from it, but also don't take that personally because it's about the, the work and not about you. It's hard though. <laughs> thank you so hey, much. Madam Curie, I know. Thank you, Trisha, for those questions too. This has been so informative. Yay. I know. Round of applause. Thank you. Yay. And before I go, I taught you how to say hello in Polish. Remember? Dzień dobry. To say hello. Would you like to know how to say goodbye in Polish? I will tell you to say goodbye. We say do widzenia. So do widzenia. Do widzenia. 
Dovidenia. Dovidenia. Yes. All right. Lena, please, um, I would like to, you know, introduce, reintroduce um, Dr. Lena. She's also the founder and director and the creator of uh, this incredible event, but of STEM Santa Fe as well. And so Lena, please, let's talk about the tribute that we're going to have here. Yeah, and uh, before the tribute, I would like to quickly acknowledge the planning committee I had the privilege to work with 10 awesome women in STEM. We've been working very hard for three months and they all have full-time jobs and, and they still work with me on the weekends and uh, in the evenings and to put on this wonderful conference. And um, they didn't wanna come on the screen tonight, but I do have a screenshot of them. <laughs> so I'm gonna share that. Well, you've met Trisha. Trisha actually is uh, on the staff of STEM Santa Fe. She is the operations and Outre outreach specialist, and she is on the registration committee for this conference. Zoe Ledbetter, right there above Zoe. Uh, she is on the workshop committee along with Debbie Post. And in addition, we've got Kara, and I'm gonna mess up her last name, Louis jo Johan. And she's on the registration committee with Trisha and with Hope Cahill. Uh, thank you, thank you. We worked very hard in reaching out to the girls and the parents back and forth. Um, I also would like to thank on the committee, Imani and Shauna Adams. We've got twin, they're twins and both of them are engineers at Sandia Lab. Uh, also Alex Junko and Jessica Shaw, the IT committee, and Jessica is running in our live YouTube uh, show right now, broadcast. <laughs> I hope I didn't forget anybody. We also have our uh, graphic design intern, Josh Haggard, who was great. We have a lot of people to thank who are working behind the scenes, Christy Salazar, uh, Janelle, Vihel Miastas, they brought, she's the one who brought us the microscopes to all the girls. Krista Salazar, you know, with the Del Norte Credit Union van carrying all the materials around between Los Alamos and Santa Fe and Española. Thanks to Lisa Van de Graaf also for all her input and, and creativity helping us out. Um, the planning committee has been awesome, but we also had a lot of volunteers the workshop presenters, the donors, the sponsors of STEM Santa Fe, and the sponsors of this event. And I wanna take a moment to thank them too. I, we couldn't have done this without their support. So our Diamond STEM sponsors, Santa Fe Community Foundation, Lanel Foundation, Sandia Area Federal Credit Union, Santa Fe Hestia Fund, Wildflower International our platinum STEM sponsor, N3B Los Alamos, gold STEM sponsor, Enterprise Bank and Trust, silver STEM sponsors, Intel, Walmart, Del Norte Credit Union, Los Alamos National Lab, and Triad. In addition, we have our bronze STEM sponsors, New Mexico Children's Foundation, Descartes Labs, Math Happens, Santa Fe Now, Nusenda, New Mexico EPSCOR and Sandia National Labs. Thank you all and thank you to the supporters. And the last big thanks to the anonymous donor who does not want her name mentioned, but who is a nurse and she values science so much and she values healthcare so much. And she's the one who donated the cost for all these wonderful masks that I hope you will use and the artwork was done by Josh Haggard. All right, so thank you all. And now I wanna go back to what we discussed at the beginning of this conference. And that is this, this conference is dedicated to the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I have a video to show you, and then we have a few more announcements. Chief Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a champion of equality and women's rights, a hero to many and a feminist icon for history to remember. 
She was given the nickname Notorious RBG because she used her voice to dissent, expressing a contradictory opinion based in fact and law. She is one of the most important voices in American history for women's rights and equality for all. She was the second woman and first Jewish female to be appointed to the Supreme Court, one of the most important decision-making positions in the country. She faced discrimination and fought many equal rights cases. Her life and legacy is important because many of the rights we as women have today are because of her. She has opened doors for all of us, and we hope that by learning about her legacy and hearing from some of our very own notorious women in STEM from right here in New Mexico, that you will realize there are no limits to what you can accomplish in your future. RBG grew up in a low-income, working-class Jewish family in Brooklyn, New York. She went to public school and excelled as a student. She was in orchestra, was a baton twirler, and her nickname was Kiki Bader. As a young girl, she disagreed with the notion that boys were expected to do big things, while girls were simply expected to find husbands and didn't need to go to college. Not only did she go to college, she graduated top of her class at Cornell, Harvard, and Columbia Universities, all top schools in the U.S. At Harvard, she was one of only nine women in her class of 500 men. She didn't get discouraged, though. She persisted and excelled academically, becoming the first female member of the Harvard Law Review. She had a partner on her journey, Martin, who she said was the first boy she met who cared that she had a brain. He adored her cooked for her and was her biggest cheerleader and supported her career aspirations. Even though she was smart and had graduated top of her class, she was turned down for jobs simply because she was a woman. She found another way. She became a professor at Rutgers and at Columbia, where she became the school's first female tenured professor. She discovered though that she was being paid less than her male counterparts. Can you imagine getting paid less for the same job just because you are a woman? She purposefully pursued making a change, not just for herself, but for all of us. First, she laid the groundwork. She served as the director of the Women's Rights Project of the American Civil Liberties Union, for which she argued six landmark cases on gender equality before the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1993, she was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court by President Clinton. Because of her groundbreaking cases working at the ACLU and during her tenure on the court, the following advancements were made. State-funded schools like the Virginia Military Institute could no longer discriminate and had to start admitting women. This case led to increased opportunities for women in the military and across the U.S. And today, gender and pregnancy discrimination is also not allowed. Employers cannot discriminate against gender or reproductive choices. And her work paved the way for equal credit opportunity and gave women the right to financial independence. Now we have our own bank accounts, credit cards, and own our own homes. We can all learn a lot from RBG. Her example showed us to be determined and to speak up. She was small in stature and had a soft voice but she spoke up and spoke strongly. Your voice can be heard and you can make a difference no matter your size, gender, race, or background. And she taught us to stand in our truth, even if you stand alone. Stand with conviction. What you feel in your heart is right, even if your opinion isn't popular. And be resilient. RBG faced discrimination, multiple bouts of cancer, and every time she got knocked down, she got right back up. She also taught us to care for others and to surround ourselves with people who care and support us. She fought for the rights of women and equality for all, and she surrounded herself with those who encouraged and supported her. Most of all, she showed us that women can be anything we want to be, a scientist, an engineer, in a technology career or Supreme Court justice like RBG, or even Vice President of the United States like Kamala Harris. Because of her, we all stand here as strong, successful women in male-dominated fields like STEM. And because of her, there is absolutely no career out of reach for each one of you. 
We thank you and we honor you, RBG. Now let's hear from some of our very own Notorious Ladies in STEM who would like to share their thoughts on RBG. Thank you, RBG. Because of you, a whole new generation has been given opportunities to follow their dreams, no matter what their gender. I'm Nicole Spence, and I'm a materials and chemical engineer working in the aerospace industry. I love my job because I get to solve new and exciting cha and challenging problems every day. And every new problem we solve, we get that little bit closer to figuring out how the universe works. So I have two favorite RBG quotes. I'm an immigrant from South Africa, and one day she spoke to some newly naturalized citizens, and she said, we are a nation made strong by people like you. RBG always valued diversity in life experience and identity. My other favorite is, she said, when I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? My answer is, when there are nine. People are shocked, but there's been nine men and no one's ever raised a question about that. I love that message because it has really applied to my experience in engineering. I'm going into an industry that has been male dominated since its inception. And while we're seeing more gender diversity in the workplace, we need to remember that there's still work to do. And young women like you are gonna be doing that work. Thank you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Because of you, I know I can accomplish anything I set my mind to. RBG continually set goals to enhance herself as well as others around her, effectively becoming one of the most influential women in history and helping make America safer and fairer for women today. Hi, I'm Reza O'Malley and I'm a software engineer. A software engineer is someone who builds websites, computer programs, phone apps, and video games. Being a software engineer means I get to solve and play with puzzles every day. I also get to be creative and help build new ways to interact and play with different apps or software. Take a moment and think about your favorite video game or mobile app could be Minecraft, TikTok, whatever you love using. Do you know how that was made? That question is what fueled me to become a software engineer. So I actually have a favorite RBG quote, and that is, my mother told me to be a lady. And for her, that meant be your own person, be independent. As a woman, Remember the struggles that RBG went through to make it possible for you to go out and be whatever you want to be. Now it's your turn to do your very own tribute to RBG. Do your research on RBG's life and work. Make a video tribute or write a short essay. Tell us about something in her life and work that you find inspiring and why you think it is important to women and to you and your future. If you find a quote you like, share that with us too. Video tributes should be at least one to two minutes and no more than five minutes long. We encourage you to have fun and to be creative. Dress up like RBG if you like or wear your favorite girl power or STEM t-shirt. You can add any background props or video effects, or simply take a selfie video and let your words speak for themselves. If you choose to do an essay, the essay should be 250 to 500 words. Video and essay submissions are due Monday, November 30th, and should be sent to info at stemsantafe.org. Submissions will be reviewed by the New Mexico Tech Council Women in Technology Group. The top three submissions will be selected based on their research and how they expressed their personal connection to RBG's legacy. First place prize is a Dell tablet donated by Wildflower International. All participants will be invited to join the Women in Technology virtual meeting in December, where prizes will be awarded and we will watch the video tributes together. Thank you and have fun. Thank you, New Mexico Tech Council, for an amazing video and a tribute for RBG. And now we come to the announcements that we have. And you just heard on the video, the first announcement is that we are going to have two contests. Well, yesterday you heard about one more. So we have three contests. 
The first contest is a photo contest that is based on the microscope that you receive. The second contest is a video. And the third one is an essay contest. So the video contest and the essay contest is on RBG. So we want you to research who RBG is and then write about her or send us a video about her. Okay, and guess what? The first prize winner of each contest is a tablet, a Dell Latitude tablet computer donated by Wildflower International. In order to help you even more with your research, CCA in Santa Fe is going to provide the documentary of RBG for free streaming for 48 hours free of charge. However, we're gonna wait till next weekend to give you the 48 hours to watch it. Uh, remember that the deadline for all three contests is November 30th, Monday, November 30th by, by midnight. One last thing I wanna remind you is that we will be sending you one more survey to fill out. You filled out a lot of surveys today for each workshop that you attended. We love getting your feedback. Your feedback is very important for us so we can always improve what we're doing. And um, we will send you one more survey. And if you choose to put your name on it, this will be entered in a raffle, then we're gonna raffle off a $50 Amazon gift card. And that's, that's it for me. Anything else, Shannon or Tricia? I'm really looking forward to seeing some of these essays and videos, as well as the photos from the 100X uh, microscope for the smartphones. This is really exciting stuff. And thank you, everyone, um, the participants, the committee, Lena, and everybody else that Lena already thanked. Thank you, everybody, for doing this. And so, Tricia, do you have anything else to add? I don't. I don't. I just want to take a second to thank all the families and all the students who participated, um, the energy you girls brought, the fantastic questions you guys asked, not only during the Q&A, but just during your workshops. And, and no one was afraid to speak up if they were stuck or didn't understand anything. The presenters were fantastic. So really, thank you to everybody. This was this was definitely a massive team effort and everybody pulled it off amazingly, so. We look forward to getting all your photos. We're gonna post them on social, our social media, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, your videos, and we look forward to meeting you and wearing a mask. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Can you lead us out with some music? You bet. <laughs>